Hello and welcome to another World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. So a couple of months ago, I put it to the public vote which topic you, the listener, would like to hear first. The Heinkel, HG177, or a look at Operation Crossbow. Well, it was a close run thing with 56% of you voting for Crossbow. So joining me is Stephen Zagola. Stephen is a prolific military historian and analyst, and he's also written a book on Operation Crossbow, published by Osprey. Now, if you're wondering what Operation Crossbow was, it is the preemptive attack on the German rocket programme. Now, this podcast is brought to you by listeners like yourself who enjoy the show and help me find the time to put it together by becoming patrons. In committing a dollar or two each month via Patreon or even pushing the boat out and committing to the Rockefeller level of support like listener Thomas Carstens. Thank you, Thomas, for your support. Now you can find out more at patreon.com slash ww2podcast. If Patreon is not your thing for whatever reason and you would like to join the gang, go to ww2podcast.com forward slash support and you'll find information on how to support the show via PayPal. In doing so, if you check the box to be added to the mailing list, I will send you links to the extras when I have them. So that's www.podcast.com forward slash support. So Stephen, thanks for uh, thanks for joining me. Um, if we're going to be looking at the Allied response to Operation Ice Bar, uh, the polar bear, uh, let's start with that. What, what is it? Or <laughs> should I say, what, what was it? <laughs> In 1943, Allied intelligence started to pick up the first hints that the Germans were building some sort of bombardment missiles. And this was both from intelligence sources, such as various documents that came into their hands, signals, intelligence, things of that sort. But then once RAF reconnaissance aircraft started flying over the German test site at Pinamunda on the Baltic, they started picking up photographic evidence that the Germans were working on various types of missiles. And, of course, this was revolutionary new technology. They had no idea what these things were, what their range was, what kind of warhead they had, what they were going to be used for, where were they going to be fought, uh, fired against tactical targets, other armies, were they, they going to be fired against cities or that sort of thing. So actually the first evidence that the German missiles might be used against England and specifically against London, was in the earlier part of 1943 when the French resistance cued in British intelligence that there were these strange buildings being built in the Pas-de-Calais area of France and in other areas of France. And then once photos were taken, people started to realize that they were oriented towards London. And pretty soon it became evident that this was not coincidence, that these uh, sites, these concrete bunker sites, were oriented in the direction of London. And so they connected both together. The fact that at Pinamunda, the German uh, military is developing what appears to be long-range missile weapons, and at the same time, they seem to be building what they eventually believe to be missile bases. And so the uh, campaign starts with uh, RAF raids against the Pinamunda site itself, with the aim being to prevent further development of the missiles. But the uh, construction of these um, sites, uh, which eventually become known as crossbow sites in France, that starts to create the whole issue of how they should deal with these. I've made a note to myself, it's, it's rhubarb photo reconnaissance that, that f- first um, spots these sites. If you're looking for something that you don't know what you're looking for, how did they know what... <laughs> You know, it's a chicken. You've got a chicken and egg thing for the photo reconnaissance guys. How did they sort of figure out what they were looking for with these uh, f- for these sites? There were actually two different type of crossbow sites, and they were spotted for different reasons. The um, first German missile sites were what was later called uh, heavy crossbow sites. The Germans themselves used the code word for them, uh, waterworks, which was just a, a phony name. And um, what these were is that these were massive, massive bunkers that were going to be used to fire the V-2 ballistic missiles. 
And they included not only um, missile assembly halls, but they also included facilities for the production of liquid oxygen. That was the big technical bottleneck to launching V2s is the production of liquid oxygen. I mean, now we, these days we don't think of liquid oxygen as being anything special, but in 1943, 1944, there wasn't the production of a lot of liquid oxygen in Europe. It's used for some industrial processes, but not, not in the tons or hundreds of tons that you'd need for a missile campaign. So in any event, these bunkers, the, the so-called heavy crossbow bunkers, were quite large. And the reason that Allied reconnaissance, and specifically RAF reconnaissance, found them is that there was an ongoing reconnaissance program over much of coastal Europe, especially in France and Belgium and Netherlands. And the RAF was just keeping track of things like the Atlantic Wall constructions and air bases and radar sites. And it was simply for the usual military reasons. Um, for example, the RAF and the U.S. Army Air Forces were flying bomber missions into Germany. And so there was interest in keeping track of where the Germans were putting up radar sites or flak sites or fighter bases so that when they were flying the bomber missions, they would know where there's enemy positions. So in any event, the Germans start building these massive, massive bunkers. So there's some interest, you know, the thought is, well, maybe these are headquarters for a, a major unit or something, but they were located in odd locations. They weren't obvious locations for a major headquarters. And so they start getting the idea, this is something really different. The second set of sites were the ones that were being built for the smaller V1s. And these were very unusual in that they were being built in the French countryside in the middle of nowhere. Um, they weren't associated with rail lines. They weren't associated with major road networks. They were literally out in the middle of farm fields. And so, and they, and they were odd constructions. There, there'd be several little small concrete bunkers. It wasn't like it was a flak base or a radar base. It didn't resemble anything else. And in fact, if you ever see wartime intelligence guides, they actually, during the war, RAF and U.S. Army Air Force put out guides to overhead reconnaissance, and they would show the construction of typical military structures, what an air base looks like, what type of structures you associate with it, uh, flak base, um, you know, what kind of buildings do you get with a flak base, and therefore, when you got the photos in, you could compare it to what you knew about and say, aha, that's flak, aha, that's a radar site, aha, that's an airfield. These didn't match anything, and so there's a lot of mystery about what's going on. But then there's some cues from what they see at Pinamunda. They start seeing, you know, these long ramp-like devices uh, for this little aircraft type thing that they first start calling P-20, meaning Pinamunda 20, P is the Pinamunda 20 is the wingspan. And so then they start realizing, aha, uh -huh, these things are all aimed at London. They all have some sort of a ramp or what appears to be a ramp. And um, so that's probably associated with these uh, with these missiles. And they gradually pick up more evidence because, um, as you know, uh, there was decryption of uh, Luftwaffe uh, radio messages, and the Luftwaffe starts talking about some of this stuff. So they start referring to something called the, the FCG-76, which is the German name for what eventually becomes called the V-1, and, um, you know, the formation of units to service this and that sort of thing. So all of this accumulation of detail leads to the recognition that the Germans are planning some sort of missile attack on London from these crossbow sites that are located in France. And that's what provokes the campaign. At, at some point, the Allies become convinced, aha, the Germans are about to start a missile campaign. We will deal with it preemptively. We'll go out and bomb the bases. These really big, heavy uh, crossbow sites are, are, are one thing. One problem, because presumably they're reinforced concrete, they're essentially enormous bunkers but the lighter crossbow sites we weren't really doing pinpoint bombing uh very well so how did the allies go about attacking the certainly i i imagine huge big bomber raids on the heavy crossbow sites uh, are relatively successful how 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 about on the uh, lighter sites how do you how did they go about uh tackling those in this early part of the war. The attack on the light crossbow sites actually became the biggest controversy of the first stage of Operation Crossbow, the attacks that took place in the latter part of 1943 through the summer of 1944. And the issue was is that um, some of the RAF planners basically went in and said, we want to bomb these using heavy bombers. We're just going to carpet bomb these sites. Well, RAF Bomber Command came in and said, 
we don't want to do that. You know, uh, the RAF night bombers were not designed for pinpoint attack, and they didn't feel that they had the resources. They had other campaigns going on, the campaign against the Ruhr, campaign against Berlin. So they basically they, they refused to participate in the campaign. But a lot of pressure was put on Eisenhower to get the U.S. Army Air Force, the 8th Air Force in particular, involved in it because 8th Air Force had this claim of being willing to do or capable of doing daylight precision bombing. But General Spots, the head of 8th Air Force and other senior officials said, well, there's precision bombing, there's precision bombing. There's precision bombing against a big industrial facility, and there's precision bombing against a couple of small little bunkers, and it really comes down to how efficient – it is. And so actually what Spots does is he contacts the Air Force Development Commands back in the United States and says, create a replica uh, German missile site. And they do it at Eglin Air Force Base down on the Florida Panhandle. And they set up this replica crossbow site and they try bombing it in various fashions. They try attacking it with fighter bombers, with medium bombers, with heavy bombers, attack it from different altitudes, use different types of weapons, you know, rockets, bombs. Um, they actually try using uh, cannon arm bombers, you know, will that work? And they basically concluded that the most effective way to bomb these was with fighter bombers at low altitude. Things like P-38s coming in with a couple 500-pound bombs. They could see the targets well enough and they'd have a, a better chance of hitting the uh, the targets. But in any event, this controversy lingers on through February, uh, March, April 1944 with the planners in London pushing for the use of heavy bombers and 8th Air Force resisting the, uh, the, the the push to use the heavy bombers and trying to push to use more of the medium bombers and the tactical fighters. They end up using the medium bombers, but they are still, for political reasons, forced to use the uh, the heavy bombers. And the, the controversy lingers into the summer when the missile campaign finally does start. Uh, the Germans actually had planned to start the missile campaign at the end of 1943, the beginning of 1944, roughly – January 1944. For a variety of reasons, it does not start. Part of it is simply the revolutionary technology of the V1 and V2. They're they're simply not ready. You know, they're they're test firing these things. They have a very high failure rate. They're not being produced in adequate quantities. And secondly, the early crossbow campaigns actually are fairly successful. They don't necessarily destroy a lot of the buildings, but they churn up the site so much that the sites are no longer effective as a missile base. You know, you might still have the bunkers there, but there's bomb craters all over the place, so you can't replenish the missiles on the missile launch ramps or any of that sort of thing. So in any event, Operation Ice Bar, the start of the V-1 campaign, is postponed until immediately after D-Day, largely due to the lack of supply of missiles and the damage to the existing infrastructure. Now, in the meantime, the Luftwaffe, they had their own controversy. Um, within the Luftwaffe, there had been arguments for some time saying, we don't want to use these fixed site crossbow sites. We want something that's smaller and more portable because they were fully aware that the Allies, once they saw these fixed sites, would go and bomb them. And guess what happens? Of course, the Allies do go and bomb them. So it was not, not a big surprise. But in any event, so the, 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 the Luftwaffe is pushing for a, um, a site that can be built very, very quickly and then if it's lost, it doesn't matter. You know, they lose a ramp, they lose a few tents, but it's a, they can go and buy, build another site immediately. And that happens in the spring of 1944. They continue to move on the light crossbow sites, repair them, so that the Allies think that they're still going to use these light crossbow sites. But in the meantime, they start creating these small hidden sites that really only have a small building or a tent or some very elementary structure. And then only a day or two before they're ready to launch the missiles, will they bring in the big launch rail? Because the one key feature that you need at these bases is you need this big, it's essentially a steam catapult that's used to launch the V-1. So a day or two before the site becomes active, they move this big semi-portable launch ramp to the site and then erect it. And so those are very hard to find, you know, because they can be put virtually anywhere. So the second wave of crossbow, allied crossbow attacks start once the Germans actually start bombarding London using the V-1 buzz bombs. Once it is underway, how effective is it, is it Paul, about uh, Ice Bar? You're on, on, uh, well, he's, he's predominantly on London, isn't it? They don't really seem to vary targets too much. Actually, Hitler actually forbade them from using V-1s and other sites. And it's rather strange because the main ally concern, the main reason that Eisenhower continues to pressure 8th Air Force to participate in crossbow is 
he is very concerned that the Germans are going to use the V1s against the uh, the Normandy invasion uh, ports, uh, for example, Portsmouth. He's very, very afraid that the Germans are going to bombard the invasion fleet before D-Day takes place. Uh, they, they don't understand what the German mission is, so they're, they're afraid. They, they look at their, it from their own perspective, and they say, aha, if the Germans take these missiles and start bombarding the invasion ports, we're going to be in deep trouble. In fact, Hitler has specifically told the Luftwaffe that they will only bombard London, and there are actually a couple of rogue operations where the Luftwaffe did try to bombard Portsmouth and a few of the other ports, they weren't very successful because of the inaccuracy of the missile. But when Hitler learns about it, he becomes furious and says, no, I said London, I mean London. Uh, you know, the only target is going to be London. And he viewed he viewed the whole Ice Bar campaign as a retaliation for the uh, RAF campaign against the Ruhr that took place in 1943 and the continual bombardment of Berlin. He views Ice Bar as being the German equivalent of the RAF campaign against the Ruhr and against Berlin. Um, so that's his strategic vision. He doesn't he doesn't view it in terms of a military weapon against military objectives. He views it as a strategic weapon against strategic targets, in this case against London. I wondered if uh yeah that that, that concentration against London made it much more political, which actually applied pressure to the you know the American bomber barons um Harris and Spatz. So they actually couldn't get out of uh, 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 of Coring Old Cross books. If he had targeted many other places it's 20 to 25 percent of v1s get through on target which is a sizable amount on london but if you cast it out across the country might not quite have been so noticeable well that, that's that's exactly it because there was a finite number of these missiles um even though the v1 was a very inexpensive weapon um there were a finite number they could only build so many they could only launch so many and so if you do diffuse the launches across the country and you're losing a large fraction of them both to the the failure of the missile because they're technologically not very mature. And then secondly, you start losing them to air defenses, um, ARIA fighter aircraft, anti-aircraft batteries down near the coast, um, other other issues like that. So only a fraction of the missiles actually get through to their targets. So unless you concentrate them on one target, you're not going to have much of an impact. Um, had the, the area, the, the target been, say, Portsmouth, there may have been some more direct military impact. London, though, was clearly a political strategic target. It was not It was not being done, obviously, for military reasons. There was no military objectives there. They were simply being lobbed into the city. And also, the missile is very accurate. The V-1 used a very primitive guidance system, so it's accurate only within about 5 or 10 miles, depending on the version. So the only target that you really can attack is some large city size object. You can't use it to bombard, for example, air bases. And for that matter, it wouldn't have been very good for bombarding, say, the Normandy beachhead area. Um, they literally aren't accurate enough even to hit um, the Normandy beaches. And so there was a recognition that they had to be used against a relatively large target. Did the Germans make any direct attempt to defend these launch sites? I mean, are they surrounded by anti-aircraft batteries and fighter umbrellas, or was that sort of giving the game away by doing that? There, were, there was no actual defense uh, beyond very small numbers of anti-aircraft guns that were attached to the sites. But the sites were quite, were quite scattered. Um, the, the, the belt of launch sites was uh, dozens and dozens of miles long. And so to have tried to defend them with flak would have been extremely difficult. They didn't really have the resources to do it. And once they did the second generation of launch sites, they weren't quite so concerned about the Allied bombing campaign. The, um, the sites that were used for the summer V1 campaign were, as I said, I wouldn't call them semi-mobile, but they were semi-permanent. They were designed so that if they were blown up, it didn't matter. They made multiple um, copies of the the, uh, the steam catapult to launch the missile. And the rest of the structures there were basically small wooden structures or, or tents or very elementary structures. So when these sites were hit, they simply would move down the road, set up another site, launch until it was destroyed, move to another site. It was a different approach. The earlier sites were fixed, they might have thought about defending them. But of course, as you mentioned, the problem about defending the sites is that you sort of put a bullseye on them. If you go and put four or five flak batteries around each site, then everybody says, aha, that's a target that's worth hitting because they've got flak all around it. So there were small numbers of flak guns associated with the sites, but it was just sort of the average number that you'd have for any kind of Luftwaffe facility. They weren't they weren't an especially dense defense. Right, so in the middle of crossbow, D-Day happens. I mean, does that does that affect the uh, crossbow campaign? Because presumably planes would be needed elsewhere, or, or, or are they 
committed to uh, keeping up the pace of the bombing? When D-Day happens, it changes the complexion of the force that's used for Operation Crossbow. And what I mean by that is that there were basically four elements that could be used against Crossbow and that were were used for Crossbow uh, during the course of the campaign. And that's the two heavy bomber commands, RAF Bomber Command and the U.S. Eighth Air Force. And then on the tactical side, there, there's the British Tactical Air Force, Second Tactical Air Force, and there's the American Tactical Air Force, the Ninth, Ninth Air Force. And so there's these four elements that can be used. Well, once D-Day happens, the two tactical air forces, the RAF Second Tactical Air Force and the U.S. Ninth Air Force, they are committed to supporting D-Day. They're the tactical air force. They're out there to provide air support for the ground forces. And so they, uh, especially Ninth Air Force, had been used fairly heavily in the crossbow campaign in the, in the spring of 1944 before D-Day. After D-Day, they're taken off that mission. They've got more important uh, assignments to support the uh, the land campaign, and the, the same goes with the RAF's tactical air command. So that throws most of the effort to the heavy bomber people. Now, the problem is that the heavy bombers are especially not suited to attacking these little mobile sites, or they're not mobile, but as I said, sort of a semi-mobile site. So what they do is, because there's just enormous political pressure, I mean, Churchill is on the case of, the RF commanders and the, the U.S. Army Air Force commanders saying, oh, we're getting, London's getting bombarded, you have to stop this, there's rising civilian casualties, um, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the bomber people come up and say, listen, you know, we don't want to continue to hit these small sites. It's not an efficient way to use heavy bombers. So they make a variety of arguments. Well, what should we do? Should we do retaliatory raids against German cities? Everybody says, no, nah, that's probably not a good idea. We're already bombing German cities. Um, so, you know, that that's not going to really work too well. But then they say, well, we can attack the factories, except they don't know what factories are producing these missiles. So that's no good. So they realize that there's a couple of bottlenecks that rather than attack the launch sites, they should be attacking the storage areas because the launch sites don't contain large number of missiles. The way that it works is that you set up your launch site and then the day before or the evening before you launch – You move up a few dozen missiles to the site because they have a finite number they can fire through the course of an evening. So you have munitions depots located in France and along the German border that store dozens or hundreds or thousands of these missiles. And the Allies by by now understand that. By the summer, they understand that the Germans have these missile storage areas. Many of them are located in big tunnels, you know, because it's a natural protective um, situation. So they start bombing the storage sites. So the RAF starts going after the tunnels in France with what are called the tall boy bombs, these big earth penetrating uh, bombs that can collapse the tunnels. And the U.S. Eighth Air Force does similar sort of things. They bomb a number of areas that are being used by the Germans for missile storage. And they do notice, um, statistically, they notice after they start hitting these storage sites um, that what happens is the number of missiles being launched per evening is not anywhere near as great as it was earlier in the summer. And the reason is the Germans are losing many of the missiles that are being shipped from the German factories into France to be fired against London. I have to say, there's a, uh, you just maybe think that there must be a book somewhere to be written about the statisticians of the war who just spotted those kind of strange <laughs> anomalies. It's not a very rock and roll part of the war, but uh, heavens, they didn't have to do some work you know, looking at, some of really obtuse things. Oh, they did. There, there was uh, World War II saw the start of what is now called operational research, and it's basically applying statistical studies to try to improve military tactics and that sort of thing. And there is actually a book. Um, it was done up in Canada. It's called uh, Montgomery Scientists, and it's a collection of the reports that these uh, operational researchers did on various uh, uh, subjects. You know, I'll, I'll give you an example. How effective are fighter bombers attacking tanks? You know, you hear all these stories about fighter bombers attacking tanks and destroying hundreds of hundreds of panzers. Well, the operational researchers went and looked at it, and they found that all of the airplane claims against, uh, you know, blowing up all these tanks was simply not true. That there were that the claims were very exaggerated. So there was all sorts of statistical work done during the war, and as I say, it's become a, a minor field. It's, it's the field that now is called uh, operational research. I'm sure there's one that suggested that they, when they were asked how Bomber Command could uh, lower its casualties, they suggested removing all the gunners because they didn't feel they were effective. <laughs> oh, yeah, exa- exactly. There, the, the, there was very extensive operational research done 
with the whole strategic bombing program. And the other thing that was done at the end of the war, the U.S. Army Air Force had a very, very extensive program called uh, the United States Strategic Bombing Survey. And the reason I mention it is I use it quite a bit in my historical research on air campaigns. But it's this vast collection of reports where the Air Force sent teams into every factory they bombed and collected maps and data on the number of bombs that were dropped and tried to determine, you know, is this type of attack more effective than that type of attack? You know, if you're bombing, say, aircraft factories, what's the vulnerable part within the factory to attack? Is it the actual assembly halls? Is it some of the machine tools? Uh, you know, what what is in a, an aviation factory that's vulnerable to bombing attack? So there was uh, quite a bit of work done in that whole field. Uh, so we digress. So when the V2s come online... Are they a whole new problem for the Allies to knock out? Because I think they're more mobile at the launch sites, aren't they? The V2s don't come online until after Crossbow. They come online in September of 1944. What, what basically happens is that the V1 launch sites, which are mostly located in France, they're overrun. I mean, by September uh, 1944, the Allied forces are already up into Belgium and up into the Netherlands. So the launch sites are all overrun. I mean, even forgetting the bombing campaign, the Germans no longer control that uh, that territory anymore. The V-2 comes online later for technical reasons. The uh, V-2 had uh, serious technical flaws, and they didn't start actual serial production of the V-2 until uh, the later part of the summer of 1944. So they start firing them um, in the, uh, the late summer, early autumn of 1944, mostly from the Dutch coast. Um, they obviously they can't launch from France because they don't control um, uh, French territory. They start uh, launching from the Hog and from other areas. They're a problem for a variety of reasons. Um, first of all, they're purely mobile. Uh, the V2s are launched off a type of an erector trailer. It's um, it's about the size of a of a bus. Um, it has its own erector and launch pad on the back end of it. You simply make the missile go vertical, then you do all your attachments and do all your fueling, and then you go and fire it. So. As a result, after you fire the missile, you can uh, lower the launch rail and um, then just uh, take the trailer and move it away from the site. And the other thing that the Germans do is that they do a lot of the launchings from within urban areas um, on the Dutch coast on the um, expectation that the Allies aren't going to exactly go and car- carpet bomb a lot of the Dutch cities. So it's difficult from the standpoint that they're, they are not using fixed launchers. And number two, they tend to be launched from Dutch cities and the Allies are reluctant to um, attack urban areas because of the likely civilian casualties. I did uh, wonder, with the uh, sort of almost reluctance to uh, tackle things with tactical air, with, with with the tactical air force, you know, <laughs> if you counted up the casualties of the uh, of these rocket attacks compared to how many people uh, in in uh, Europe, Allied, uh, uh, you know, France, you know. I wonder, it's probably not quantifiable, did more people suffer from the carpet bombing by the Allies trying to hit the uh, rocket sites than, than perhaps uh, in London as, as, the, as the London? No, actually, the, 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 strange, uh, the strange casualty balance as far as the V weapons was concerned is um, the number of French who were killed um, in the bombing attacks against the, the crossbow sites was actually relatively small, um, and the reason was is that the Germans cleared the French civilian population from these farm areas. They didn't want the French around the launch sites because early on, one of the reasons that the Allies knew about the launch sites is that the French were reporting to the resistance where these rocket sites were. So uh, in the later phase, in the spring of 1944, the Germans basically go in and push away all the civilians away from the launch sites. So, so there aren't a lot of French in the launch sites. So the collateral civilian casualties are caused – when there's other types of attacks, for example, when the Allies are trying to attack the rail lines to stop the missiles from being fed into the launch site. So there are French casualties. I don't mean to suggest that there's not, but they're relatively small because the, the Germans have depopulated the areas where the launch sites are located. The strange thing is, though, is that there were more casualties from the manufacture of the German missiles than from the impacts in, in London. A lot of the missiles were being built in Nordhausen at the Middlewehr complex, which is an underground slave labor facility. And the conditions in the Middlewehr facility were so brutal that large numbers of the slave laborers were dying during the construction phase. So it's a strange thing where there were probably more lives lost in the construction of the weapons than in the actual uh, 
impact of the weapons in London. Yeah, it was when you described one of the sites looking like a lunar landscape. That's what got me thinking about how ineffective uh, the the bombing must have been. <laughs> Well, some some of the sites are well. It's quite a few of the sites actually are still in existence. Um, several of the heavy crossbow sites are now museums. So the site at Vatan is still a museum, and it still has its bomb craters. I've I've visited it a few times, and it, it's a lunar landscape because in the later phase of the campaign, the RAF uh, bomber squadrons were using those tall boys, which are you know massive bombs, and when they would miss, they'd create these massive craters that exist to today. I mean, you go there, you go to the Vaughan site today, and you still have gigantic craters all around the site. The V-1 sites tended to be hit by smaller, more normal-sized bombs, 500-pound, 1,000-pound bombs. Those things create a good cr- crater at the time, but over 70 years in rainfall and stuff, they, they tend to get washed away. But the, the tall boy bombs, the very heavy bombs, they leave a lasting impression on the ground. I mean, we can probably say, almost certainly say that you know, the... the, the, the um Polar bear is a is a failure for the Germans insofar as it it's not the wonder weapon that alters the course of the war. But how much of its failure can we put on the shoulders of Operation Crossbow? I think a large part portion can be put on the shoulders of Crossbow in the sense that Crossbow was able to dampen down the attacks to a considerable extent, and that was partly because it delayed the start of the campaign. Instead of starting in January 1944, it got delayed for almost six months because of the early preemptive strikes. And then once the campaign does start, the Allies are relatively successful in blasting a lot of the storage sites and limiting the number of missiles that are fired. And then, of course, I don't get too in, into it in too much detail in the book because I, I focus in the book on the bomber campaign. But there was also the defense effort on the British coast, namely the anti-aircraft guns and the RAF fighter patrols that were shooting down V-1s. So when you combine the number of V-1s shot down, the number um, that never left the launch pad because they were blown up in storage areas, and then all the delays and the other problems that were caused at the launch sites, Operation Ice Bar, the German side of the picture – would have been much more effective had the Allies been less effective in their resistance to Ice Bar. So I I think you can certainly say Ice Bar probably would have failed anyways. I mean, the Germans just simply didn't have the resources to create enough damage on London, even without the Allied resistance. But when you add in the technical limitations on the German side, plus crossbow in the associated campaigns, you know, that completely undermines the the whole concept. Mm. My father um, was driving Royal Army, he was in Royal Army Service Corps during the war, and before he was shipped to France in uh, September '44, he was driving ammunition to the south coast, uh, which he said was for, they were for uh, anti-aircraft guns trying to shoot down the uh, incoming V1s. Yeah, the reason I got interested in V1s, V2s was for much the same reason. My my dad was stationed in the UK um, during the war in, in ni- early 1944. He was in an engineer battalion, and they were working on Mulberry Harbors, but they were basically in the flight path of V-1s. So ever since I was a small kid, I heard these stories about the V-1s uh, flying overhead, and uh, that uh, that got me interested in V-1s and V-2s and the whole subject. So I've done several books. Besides the Crossbow book, I've done a short history for Osprey on the V-1. I've done a short history on the V-2. And I also did a book on the German missile sites, the actual the construction, the architectural construction of, of the missile sites. So ever since I was a small kid, I heard these stories. And as a result, it, it, it had impact on my later writing career. It's funny how it captured. I don't know if you captured their imagination, stuck stuck in their minds. Because I remember him saying he was in he was in London and he remembers them passing by and he remembers the noise and the, st- the, the stop. He can't be in London long. He must have only passed through it. But yeah, it really stuck with him. More, more. I say, I would say more so. He, he, my father didn't have very many anecdotes, and he can't have been driving long when I look at his war record because he was eighteen in whenever it was March uh, to the south coast before he went to France. But that really st- stuck with him, driving the ammunition. You know, the ammunition to. Um, I can't think where he said he was. It was somewhere Seven Sisters, sort of way on the south coast, somewhere around there. I think I think the reason that the V1 had a greater impression than the V2 did is because you could actually hear it coming in. The V the V2 is sort of an invisible weapon. It would it would simply explode. I mean, you didn't hear any advance. You didn't get any advance warning of V2 coming into impact. Whereas a V1 had that strange little pulse jet engine that made kind of a putt 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 sound as it as it flew into London. Then all of a sudden the putt 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 ended, and it went into its terminal dive and it exploded. 
And so it was in many respects more terrifying because you could hear it coming in. And then you hear, heard the engine kick off and it was like, oh, my God, where's that going to fall? And then, of course, you hear this big explosion when it goes off. Yeah, and I think the first V2 landed a couple of streets away from my sister's house in London for another small family anecdote. <laughs> I, I was I was just in London a few weeks ago, um, uh, touring around with a friend of mine from the UK who grew up in London. And he brought, a, brought me around to several of the V1 and V2 sites. And he, was that Craig? He, he was, yeah, Craig, Craig Moore. He was, he was showing me the sites in the sense of, um, you know, obviously the, 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 the architecture has been rebuilt, but you visit some of these sites and he, we went to one location and he said, start pacing this off. And so I forget 110 or 115 paces. And then he said, okay, that's 300 feet or whatever. And I said, well, what's the significance of that? Well, that's the crater of a V2. And when you look around, you could see that the structures that were immediately in the area of this crater was all new architecture. But that if you look further down the street, you'd see that there were older buildings there. So his point was, you can still see in London the effect of the V weapons campaign because you can tell from the architecture. When you go into these areas and you find these areas with all new, well, relatively new 1950s, 1960s construction versus the older construction, in many cases, it was because of a V weapon. Well, well, Stephen, um, shall, we, shall we leave it there? If anyone is interested in finding out more about Crossbow, Stephen's book, published by Osprey, is Operation Crossbow, 1944, Hunting Hitler's V Weapons. Don't forget, if you're interested in becoming a patron and supporting the show, you can find out more at patreon.com slash ww2podcast. And don't forget, you can find me on Facebook, ww2podcast. I do post things there that I find interesting and often in support of the current episode of the podcast. Well, that's it for now. I'm Angus Wallace, and thanks for listening.